Canada's oil and gas industry is still not firing on all cylinders, and the results of our federal election will have an effect one way or the other on the energy sector. Joining me now to discuss this is David Yeager, joining me from Calgary. He's an energy policy analyst and author of the new book, From Miracle to Menace, Alberta, A Carbon Story. David, welcome back to BCN. Ah, thank you very much. We have yet another legal review of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project taking place. Can you explain what this actually means for the project? Fortunately for Alberta, not much. Originally, when the John Horgan government was elected, they said they were going to use every tool available to block the pipeline, which include uh, their own court reviewing the National Energy Board decision. Since that time, the National Energy Board decision was overturned the first time, requiring more marine review and uh, uh, indigenous consultation. And then it was reapproved and overturned a, a second time. With the, so what, it, what it's done, really, is the NEB has looked at it itself and the government of BC has concluded there really isn't any point, anything to be gained here. And the administrative environment in that province has said as much. So it makes great headlines, but at the end, it's not, it's not the biggest problem. It's not a material setback at this stage. Now let's take a look at some of the differing energy policies of the federal parties. If the Liberals are re-elected, the federal carbon tax will continue to rise from $20 to about $50 a metric ton by 2022. How effective will this be in reducing carbon emissions and how will it really impact oil and gas companies? Uh, the market demand for things like gasoline is sort of somewhat price insensitive when you live in a large cold country. The same thing with natural gas. So we, we don't really have the impact as much as you could. Like electric vehicles would be one carbon taxes might cause someone to go to electric vehicles, but they're range limited in a large cold country. And so we're not as, as responsive to increase to carbon taxes or uh, as other as other nation, as other nations are further the government gives rebates to people at certain income levels so that at the end of the day they're not really uh, paying more and then of course it's also based into the cost of everything and so that means it's more of a consumer tax than necessarily an industry tax i get a kick out of uh, ottawa the canada food guide says we should eat more fruits and vegetables particularly can't grow them in the winter except in greenhouses. And of course, the cost of bringing them in is more. So it's clear one arm of the government isn't talking to the other. But it's, it's going to make things more expensive. A pure carbon tax is meant to have offsetting taxes to be revenue neutral. They're supposed to take it off the PST or the GST or income taxes, but they prefer to collect the money and give it out for political reasons. So we don't have a pure carbon tax. It's going to hurt. So, David, if the Liberals are re-elected, Bill C-69 and C-48 would remain in place. Critics say this would basically stop any further large oil investments and pipelines from going ahead. Is that true or just maybe an overreaction? Uh, Bill 48 is the tanker ban, and uh, that will not stand the test of time. The, I believe it's the Eagle Spirit uh, project in northern B.C. wants to build a, a pipeline to the coast. Uh, around Kitimat and anchor it there. They're, they're challenging that bill in court. That is really a cynical piece of legislation. It's the only legislation of its type. They're still running uh, tankers up and down the St. Lawrence. I don't believe that at the end of the day that, that, that bill will stand. C-69, as it currently is constituted, is certainly going to object uh, blocker uh, activity, but it will block all activity. And so it's one thing to say about pipelines, but the power lines, mines, other large industrial projects will be the, do the same thing. I see that legislation has already been amended. I see further amendments coming down the pipe as people more in, in other industries realize that it's unworkable in so many ways. And uh, for the purposes of the election, to appeal to their base, I think the Liberals have to leave it in place. But after, if they are reelected, um, I think one won't stand, the other will be amended. The Liberals are also promising to ban single-use plastics by the year 2021. To what degree would that really affect the petroleum industry? Uh, if they did it on a global basis, it would be material. It would be significant. Uh, a plastic or petrochemicals are 25% of the use of a barrel of oil. Uh, in Canada, it would have no bearing on anything, including the oceans. All the studies I've read indicate that the place where plastics cause the biggest problem is in the oceans, that 90% of those come from uh, uh, Asia and Africa. And so it is, it is virtue single, uh, signaling and symbolism. It's one of those feel-good issues where you can stand for something and everybody says that's a good idea. Uh, at the end of the day, they've already talked about the number of exemptions they're going to have to put in, like for medical procedures and so on. And so, yeah, again, it's, we do a lot of that these days. It's uh, a lot of that stuff on the climate file. Say, well, this sounds pretty good, won't cost very much. I can look like I'm doing something. 
uh, will affect the petroleum industry if we quit using plastic. But on a global basis, Canadian demand is not measurable. So the NDP say they want to end fossil fuel subsidies and instead put that money into retraining workers, research and innovation in green technology development. And David, they claim their plan will create about 300,000 new jobs. Any thoughts on that? The subsidies that they're trying to eliminate aren't cash subsidies the way we think. Uh, a lot of people think that there's, ca there's checks written, uh, for example, during the auto bailout uh, during the crash. That, that was a, those were true cash subsidies. Most of the money the uh, oil industry gets are in taxes not collected. For example, deductions on uh, certain expenditures. Uh, capital investments, for example, like all businesses are allowed to do that. If you buy new machinery, uh, you get to write it off over a period of time. And, and so this, the term subsidy, you have to be careful. In many countries around the world, oil truly is subsidized in the sense that it sells for $50 a barrel, but the citizens only pay 10. Now that's a cash subsidy. So the idea that you end the subsidies, this is somehow going to result in a, a collection of cash what will happen is, is that industries that, that, that are qualifying for these deductions that have been renamed subsidies will discover their investments aren't economic and they won't spend the money anyway. So any idea that, it, that they can convert that into cash to do something else with is, is disingenuous, but it, it's a complex accounting issue that most people don't understand. As for the job creation of 300,000 jobs. There's no question if, if they get a hold of a bunch of money and start building uh, LRTs, uh, light rail transit systems, and spend enough money on uh, mass transit electric power, you can, you can buy a lot of jobs with a lot of money. I'd like to see the net jobs figure. This is something that we haven't seen is, okay, we got 300,000 jobs from government direction of spending on insulating buildings and, and uh, light rail transit, um, electric vehicle subsidies. How much money are they not going to get? How many people will lose their jobs? And so, again, this is one of those things. Uh, we've got a plan for green. Uh, we're going to create a bunch of jobs. It all sounds good. There's no science behind it, and I'm really glad you're asking the question because so much of the election coverage is not asking the question. It's, it's a bit disingenuous in my view. Now, and the NDP also believes they'd be able to have all of Canada powered solely by net carbon-free electricity by the year 2030. You know, I'm thinking of the blackout from, uh, what was it, 2003 in the East Coast when I moved up to Toronto back then. And uh, you talk electricity, it kind of scares me if you put all your eggs in that one basket. But is that realistic? Net carbon-free electricity by 2030? I have no idea how that is going to work, and I, I'm not even under, I'm not even sure what the definition of net electricity is. I mean, when we had a really real cold snap in Alberta in uh, last winter, uh, they, they're tracking where energy comes from, and on a cold day, cold cloudy day where the sun isn't working and the wind isn't blowing, uh, something like 99% of the energy we we consume came from uh, uh, non renewable sources, primary coal and natural gas. That's all we have. And so again, I, there, there's all these talk about great advancements in renewables being a substitute on a broad basis. So I, I, I don't understand how this is going to work. Uh, nuclear would work. Uh, but again, there's some problems with that. And hydro would, would technically be renewable. But of course, we don't try building a dam, try building a nuclear power plant. So I mean, it's, it's an aspirational goal. But again, we, we, the, the media today in the campaign, we print these things. We don't really peel back the onion and do the research. I don't see how it's going to work. So if Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives form government, they say they would repeal C69 and C48 and chop the carbon tax. How would that affect our oil and gas sector? Well, this, there's, there's a number of things that we have to do to, uh, to reinstate investor confidence, international investor confidence in our industry. There have been tens of billions. As a matter of fact, if you include uh, money spent by U.S. Uh, Canadian pipeline companies expanding in the States because they can't get anything built here, if you take the amount of foreign oil sands um, companies that have sold out, plus the amount of money Canadian pipelines and, and other companies have invested elsewhere, we've had a net cash outflow, a net capital outflow of something like $80 billion. And people just don't want to invest here. And so this would be a major signal and we still have, uh, that Canada is again open for business. And so this would be a, a real boost to the, uh, the battered up uh, upstream oil and gas industry. There's no question. Conservatives have promised to end foreign funded interference and regulatory hearings. How big of a deal is that? 
You know, I, I, this is a very controversial issue with, um, with what particularly uh, what we're going on in Alberta with the UCP. This is where it started. It sort of expanded to the federal party. I have read the websites for the uh, Corp Ethics. They were the funders of the TAR campaign or the developers back in 2008, where they actually bragged on their own webpage until Wendy Mesley exposed them on CBC News, how they blocked landlocked Canadian oil and they uh, helped overthrow the conservative governments in Alberta and Ottawa. And then you go over to 350.org, Bill McKibben shop, and he's bragging that in 2017, the activities of a U.S.-based uh, uh, non environmental non-government organization helped stop the Energy East pipeline. And so at some point or another, uh, when, you know, the foreign interference in the affairs of a country is a big deal in the States. I mean, they're still arguing about whether or not Russia got involved in, uh, in, in Trump's election. And so we're, we're, I don't know. I, I think this is bad. I, I, I've read the websites myself, and I think this is appalling. And, and so I think it's the right question to ask. But, of course, the, the suggestion has been made uh, that some of these organizations are also uh, supporting certain political parties. Again, this is I'm, I don't know which ones, and I haven't seen it myself. So I, I, we're having the, 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 the can of worms is open, if you will, uh, in Alberta, and if we can expand it nationally and have a good look at where the funds, where the funds that affect the lobbyists come from, certainly in a political campaign, you can't do that. Corporations are strictly prohibited or monitored in participation. Uh, why are other organizations not subjected to the same, at least, uh, analysis? The Green Party has some interesting proposals, David. They want to cancel the Transmont Pipeline expansion, place a ban on fracking, and no new fossil fuel projects in Canada. They also want to end importing foreign oil to Canada. Your thoughts on those? I've never seen a national leader campaign on the destruction of hundreds of thousands of jobs before in my life. You know, if you look back at the history campaigns, I mean, I'm not the oldest guy in the world, but I've been around for a few elections. And it's generally, it's job creation, not job destruction. So Elizabeth May uh, is going to get Canada and Canada alone out of the oil business in a heck of a hurry. And the, the economic impact is going to be devastating. I mean, that's why I wrote the book I wrote. I mean, Alberta without oil is Manitoba with mountains. I mean, quite seriously, there's the, the only reason 4 million people live here is because our large fossil fuel industry is going to end imports, uh, which is not a bad idea, but not for long. She's also going to end exports. And so the net, uh, the net loss to Alberta's oil industry would be something like 2.5 billion uh, million barrels a day. So there's two glimmers of hope for, for the oil industry in Alberta today. One is some pipe in Trans Mountain, and the other is LNG Canada, uh, which would resuscitate the, mor the moribund price of natural gas, which is the largest single economic problem we have. Uh, Elizabeth May and the Green Party is opposed to both. She won't fare well in, in this province, and it's, it's, it's really astonishing, but uh, I guess that's the way of the world. There are some municipalities in Texas that are actively lobbying Canadian energy firms to move their businesses south of the border with offers of lower taxes, even free land, and it seems to be working, David. What do we have to do to compete with that? Um, well, the, the Kenny government has caught on by uh, reducing uh, two, uh, two initiatives, really. One was reducing the corporate tax rate from 12% to 8 over a few years, and the other was looking at red tape. Uh, Canada has, or Alberta and Canada, have, have, thanks to runaway prosperity over the last few years, allowed themselves to become an expensive place to do business. So there are initiatives uh, being examined here to see if we can't be, make ourselves more competitive. Now, how attractive that is, I don't know. I will say that there's been a time in the past where most folks wouldn't have thought of that. But I do believe that the general investment climate, and this goes back to the Trudeau administration and the, and the conservative administration in Alberta, where they allowed the cost of government to go up and the cost of red tape to go up, is we have a real competitive issue. Uh, Texas isn't that way. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I, myself, I, I don't see moving there myself, but I can certainly see if you're running a business and you're having all the challenges we're having, including transportation access and the extra cost of being in the middle of nowhere and the, and the, the seasonality costs more. Uh, and, you, and you are mobile and you have to look at it. It's pretty expensive. I have set up operations in the United States before for our own company. And the only easy part is talking about how, how cheap it is. It's, it's really complex. In the United States, it's not that easy place to get into, particularly with your workers. So it might be a little bit oversold in terms of cost and complexity. 
but it does certainly draw attention to the competitiveness of Canadian business at this time. David, if Canada does elect a new federal government in October that repeals 69 and C48, how long do you think it'll take to regain investor confidence in our energy sector? Oh, about 10 seconds. <laughs> I mean, no, but I think imme the immediate impact will be, aha, and it's not so much of what they are, uh, not that the, the, the uh, today's conservative is not that conservative, it's what they're not. Uh, I mean, getting rid of those two bills, which are particularly troubling to the oil and gas industry, that helps. Uh, but they're not the, the greed party <laughs> that wants to get out of the oil business. They're not the NDP uh, that's going to end, uh, you know, tax write-offs. It's not the not the Liberal Party that's going to raise carbon taxes. So the co the com cumulative impact is is okay. It's not so much that the CPC. Uh, they're <laughs> it's, it's still Canada, <laughs> still a big government country, and so it's not going to be a miracle. But certainly the signals. Uh, that cause investors to, to pause before they say, am I going to really, do I really want to invest in the oil and gas business in Canada? We did have one positive development. Unfortunately, it was a tragedy half a world away. Uh, there was the, just the 10 days ago, there was the attack, uh, attack on the oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. And, and Canada w used to be regarded as a, a safe and secure place to invest. Well, we kind of, <laughs> the safe and secure, we've pushed the envelope on that, but there are no missiles flying here. And so security of supply um, in all aspects, not just economic security supply, but strategic security supply is back on the international radar screen after a bit of a hiatus. And so that, that, might, that might help as well. But again, that's not related to the current election. David Yeager is an energy policy analyst and author of From Miracle to Menace, Alberta, A Carbon Story. Thanks a lot for joining me today from Calgary. Well, thanks for the call. I hope I could help.